know what really makes us mad? Is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah. Tell them about punk. What's up, posers? Welcome to Punk Lotto Pod. I'm your co-host, Justin Hensley. And I'm your other co-host, Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where we choose one year at random and select one punk, hardcore, emo, or punk-adjacent album from that year to discuss. And before we get into that, if you head on over to our Patreon, you get access to all of our weekly bonus audio. That's patreon.com slash punklottopod. And yeah, $1, you get access to hundreds of recorded audio that we've done this Past week, we did an I'm Listening, which talks about the music we listened to over the last month. Uh, we did some little bit of just kind of talking about movies randomly or TV shows at the beginning of that episode. Not sure why we did that. Thought we were padding, and then we wound up actually having plenty to talk about <laughs> on the on the actual audio. But you also get access to new release updates, Moon Pies for Misfits, and any of our other many different series that we do. Um, currently doing a challengeography series on the band P- Pinback. First episode of that is up there as well. And yeah, we got lots of different stuff there for you to enjoy. And if you really want to do something special, you can join at the $10 tier. It's just a one-time $10 donation, and you get to choose what album we devote an entire episode to, which we will then put into the main feed. So uh, yeah. It's a fun thing. We haven't done one of those in a minute. Definitely would love to have another one of those soon. But let's get into it. So we wrapped up our Halloween Spooktacular. That was our Psychobilly horror punk and gothic rock themed series. And so we were like, well, what's next? Uh, let's just do let's let's stay off the themes for a minute because we're coming up on the end of the year. So we'll probably do some new release audio for a couple weeks there. Not new release, but best of 2023 audio around that. We'll probably do a Christmas episode and maybe we'll throw in a theme or something later in in November. But as of right now, no theme in particular. I was just like, here's a year. Pick something. So we hadn't done the 70s in a long time. That's one of the years, the decades that we've we've avoided recently just because we've done a lot of them a lot. And there's not a ton left that we've not covered. Uh, there's. The 70s are not rich with punk music. Well, that's not the right word. There's not a lot of density. <laughs> 70s are not rich with punk music. The decade decade in which punk music started. Meaning that like there's like 100 records or, you know, to 200 records that are punk. And then that's about it. Whereas like the 90s, it's like thousands of records are called punk. So uh, the depths aren't quite there for punk music in the 70s. But it is that also that time period where almost everything is notable because, you know, the genre is being kind of built at this point. So, like, everything that came out during this period got a little more attention than, say, like, oh, the 400th album on a out on a list of records from 1997. You know, I meant to pull up the last time we covered the year 1978. But let's do that now. Uh, I believe it was sometime last year. We last covered it. Yes. June 22nd, 2022, where we did the Talking Heads, more songs about buildings and food. So that was the last time we discussed the year 1978. And then prior to that, we discussed Blondie's Parallel Lines, The Clashes, Give Them Enough Rope, X-Ray Specs, Germ-Free Adolescence, and The Saints, Eternally Yours. So we've done 78 a few times now. So before we get into the actual record that you chose for us to talk about, we mentioned this on the I'm listening on Patreon where we listened to a lot of 78 music before we made our, well, I guess we made the decision kind of early on, but before we recorded this episode. So what are some other records from that year that you were strongly considering talking about? So you sent, you assigned me the year mm-hmm. and you said there's a lot of good records uh, that we haven't covered <laughs> yet. They're still available. And I think my response was, yeah, yeah, but I'm not going to do those. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) My my first inclination for what I wanted to pick this year was to look for a record that I am less familiar with. That was where I started Uh, because you've seen the title of this episode and you're like, (laughs) well, Dylan, I know you've heard this record. But (laughs) so what I what I essentially did to narrow the field so i'm not like oh should i do 
that, you know, whatever, like big records, which we'll talk about when we really look at the charts. But I I pulled my rate your music. I pulled the year and punk on rate your music and I filtered it by records that I have not rated. It gives you the option. There's a button you can click where you can exclude you can exclude releases that you have rated prior. So I was like, all right, let me just go ahead and weed those out. What are the records I have not spent a significant amount of time with in, say, the last several years, the last five or six years or more? I'm trying to think of when I've like really got really, really consistent about rating everything on Rate Your Music. Well, it seems about like probably concurrent with the, the beginning of this show a little bit prior to starting this show. So I was like, OK, what if I what have I not listened to? What have I overlooked that maybe I've heard before or like maybe a band that I'm familiar with with a record that I don't know that well? And my first well, my first poll was the one that I sent you. Uh, or was the one that we picked. I mean, that was literally like right at the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> I did consider Go To by XTC. Which is their third record, I want to say. Uh, it is the second record that they released in 1978, which we should probably... No, this is the second album. Sorry. I misspoke. Second album by XTC, second album in 78. Uh, we should probably go through the list and figure out all of the bands that put out two <laughs> albums in 78 because there there's so lot. many. <laughs> yeah, there are a ton. So I, I I, very, very close, was very, very close to picking Go To. It's probably like actually my second choice. And it's the follow up to White Music. And White Music, I know, is really good. And I, I really enjoyed that record. I don't really know go to. I didn't really know go to prior. I've I've been more familiar with kind of some of their later stuff, Drums and Wires, Black Sea, English Settlement, all records I really enjoy. I've heard some later stuff that I like a little less, but I was like go to, that's early early in the band. Uh it has that iconic black album cover with just like the wall of white text on it. Mm-hmm. Which is like this is a record cover. The writing is the design upon the record cover. It's just this like very like meta joke kind of big thing i was like this record is kind of got kind of a low rating on right your music but i know the album cover and i've known the album cover for a really long time i knew that album cover before i realized it was even xtc like so i was like there's it can't be that bad it's in between two great records and it's not that bad i did listen to it this week uh, i did listen to a lot of 78 records some of which i talked about on the i'm listening so I won't really talk about them on here, but I'll talk about some of the other ones. And it's good, but it is lacking on really standout songs. I am the audience and like maybe Red, I think, are like the strongest songs on here. So I'm glad I'm glad I didn't pick this one, but I do think it's a good record. And I think it's kind of underrated. There just may not have been as much to really chew on with that one because it is such an in-between record. I also considered So Alone by Johnny Thunders. Johnny Thunders from New York Dolls, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, and now at this point just Johnny Thunders. I've heard of Johnny Thunders in the Heartbreakers record. It's pretty good. I was like, all right, that's kind of an important person. I considered that one. You seemed pretty hesitant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out of the like the couple that, that you sent me initially, I was like, nobody's gonna listen to an episode on Johnny Thunders. <laughs> we <laughs> like Dylan classically going for the one that no one cares about uh, <laughs> from the years. Uh, I did listen to that record. It's all right. Yeah, that's really why good. nobody cares about Johnny Thunders. <laughs> I think the only people who care about Johnny Thunders are guitar players from the 70s who started punk bands. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty it was pretty quickly eliminated in in my consideration. It was just one of the like six records I was like that I pulled <laughs> immediately. <laughs> yeah. As we were going, like you just kept sending things just like <laughs> trying to send more and more things. I was like, 
w- what are you going to pick? Because usually you know, we just narrow it down to a few, and then, then it just turned into we could cover this, we could cover that. I pulled uh, the Rosillos. not a real word so i think you can just say it how they probably said it <laughs> <laughs> well the residuals because <laughs> uh i thought that they were a latin band uh but no they're from scotland so i was like oh i'm far less interested in this <laughs> i thought they were like an early la chicano punk band but they're not they're just a scottish power pop band. <laughs> uh, i did listen to that record there's some stuff i like there's some stuff i don't they have a woman vocalist on like half of the songs maybe so I listened to this record, too, out of all the stuff that was like on 78. This is one that I listened to, too. And I was like, hey, this is actually pretty good. Like, I actually enjoyed this record quite a bit. There was definitely way more there than uh, I thought there was going to be. I was definitely throwing them in the pile of the also rands of 70s punk. But and they kind of are. But I the, bet them being Scottish makes them stand apart a little bit. They kind of like they kind of are when they're the most punk sounding on this record, but they have some very power poppy garage rocky stuff on here that I think stands on its own. Yeah, I was definitely impressed by this album. I definitely thought there was a a decent amount on here that I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Faye Fife, that's that's uh, Sheila Hind on vocals. Did we figure out if there's any relation to Chrissy Hind? It might even be spelled differently. I don't know. Uh, Chrissy Hind is spelled H-Y-N-D-E. Don't think Chrissy Hind is Scottish. Well, this is also spelled H Y N D E. So yeah, Faye Fife. Yeah, who is Scottish? So yeah, just the same last name. But yeah, I really like that record. I was surprised at how how good it was. There's definitely it, a lot of power pop to it. Yeah, it it was better than I thought it would be. Sure, I did consider that Reckless Eric record. I go the whole way. Yeah, and that record's like, really good. On on the strength of Whole Wide World alone, am I going to pick that record? I put yeah. it on this week, and I maybe just wasn't in the mood for it. But I didn't get, I didn't finish it. I didn't actually get very far into it. I think I was. It, it was much more abrasive than I expected it to be. I didn't love it. I didn't finish it. I think I did that on a starting five too. I think I did that record. Yeah, I think you've talked about it before. You want to um, talk about the kids and real kids debacle? That... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I uh, I did pull a screenshot of the kids album from 78 and sent it to you. And I was like, that was when I was kind of considering. And I realized that I actually wanted to listen to the real kids more. <laughs> Two bands doing garage rock. I think that's what you'd call both of them. Honestly, they're like the beginning of of garage rock revival. Both having black and white album covers with like just the band on the cover, <laughs> both with kids in the name and the real kids, I want to say, actually started as the kids. So I think they changed their name in response to another band being called the kids. I didn't find any confirmation on that, but that's my suspicion. The real kids, I did actually listen to their record from 78, which I have apparently listened to before and I did not realize that <laughs> and I had rated it before the real kids is the dude who was in the modern lovers like the other guitarist in the modern lovers man everybody in the modern lovers went on to do something else uh what do the other guys do well one of them's in talking heads Jerry Jerry right uh then uh oh right David Robinson's in the cars an old dude main dude like had his whole career and um Ernie Brooks did other things, but I don't know any of these bands. Yeah, um, I didn't get around to listening to the kids record. I, didn't, I only listened to the real kids record, <laughs> which was pretty good. There's a hard F in there. Ooh. And I was like, I know it's the time period because there's a hard R in a Saints record. And there's a lot of hard N's. <laughs> yeah. In general. <laughs> a lot of, of punk records from this time period. So, yeah. like, I don't know how we're ranking the slurs, but... <laughs> It's also in like a song that sounds like it's not even really a very serious song anyway. So I don't know. I listened to the modern dance by Pierre Ubu. 
And after listening to it, I sent you a message saying, I want to downvote Pierre Ubu's The Modern Dance. <laughs> <laughs> I had it in my head that I liked that record. There's things I like about them. It's just too weird and too skronky. Yeah, I've listened to The Modern Dance earlier this year. I kind of considered dub housing the second Pierre Ubu record from 78. Uh, which is probably a good opportunity for us to run down the list of bands that put out two albums in 1978. Yeah, let's but, uh, do that. Yeah. So Blondie. Pure, Pure Ubu, I don't, I don't love. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're weird. They're super weird. So the, the two albums in 1978 is Pure Ubu, or yes, Pure Ubu, one of them. Uh, Blondie released Plastic Letters and Parallel Lines the same year. Do we have two Elvis Costellos? No, not. It's just a single Elvis Costello. Okay. Two XTC records. Two Saints records. There's a couple of two ninety nine two nine 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 records. Yep. Two Sham sixty nine records. Right. There's only one boys record, right? Yeah, the other record came out I think in seventy seven. Yeah. I think that's I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's everybody. At least the big ones. Uh besides our main band we're yeah. talking about today. Right. Oh oh, um the kids, the Belgian kids put out two albums in seventy eight. Oh, okay. So this there's two reckless Eric records. Two rec- uh, yep. <laughs> well uh, why why so, what was everyone doing they were trying to outrace the the trend they were worried that the trend was going to be dead and nobody wanted to make punk music anymore so they're like let's crank them out let's crank them out because really by the end of 77 we've already introduced post-punk so and the sex pistols are broken up are they broken up by the end of 77 or are they make it a 78 well the first pill records in 78 yeah so it's yeah it's a race to it's a hot trend there's a lot of money being pumped into it almost all of these bands are signed to major labels there's a handful that are only on like independent labels it's just like we're, we've got this moment we got this thing we gotta we gotta capitalize on it and so then there everybody's just recording music like that's pretty much all they do a lot of that comes from too like the uk scene at this time like the young people at this time a lot of them were unemployed or working like really shit jobs and so there's a lot more free time to do stuff so not only do you have this like it's a youth movement uh it's a youth movement with a lot of time on their hands and it's a youth movement with a lot of money being ingested invested into it so like it actually kind of makes sense why that there were so many like quick turnarounds like even if you didn't do a record in 77 or you only did one in 77 there's a couple double records in 77 the damned being like the really famous one yeah but like a lot of these bands would put out at least three three records between 77 to 79 most of them like four so yeah yeah because because even like wire didn't put out two records in 78 but they put out pink flag in like december of 77 and chairs missing in september of 78 so less than a year apart from each other yeah and yeah i guess we can is there anything else that's like on here that we've not really mentioned that I guess should be mentioned. Yeah, there's big stuff. Um, Devo's first album question. Are we not men? Great mm-hmm. record. Uh, I listened to it earlier this year, revisited it earlier this year. Still not the Devo that I love. We, we need to do Devo at some point. So you need to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. All right. Well, I'll pick one someday. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I We've, did kind of consider that police record. Um, yeah, yeah. Outlandos de Amor. Because um, it is good. I, I think the police were police were a good band. Way better than Sting Solo. Yeah. Um, I love Adventure by Television. Uh, Susie put out The Scream. Mm-hmm. Ramones put out Road to Ruin. Uh, Patti Smith put out Easter, which of um, racial slurs. <laughs> yeah. punk songs uh the adverts released crossing the red sea with the adverts that record's great uh we've talked about germ free adolescence by x-ray specs before mm-hmm. great record it is still very british the americans being what talking heads devo blondie pirubu <laughs> yeah mostly honestly mostly new wave fans yeah I and mean, road to ruin came out that year as well yeah patty smith lot lot more british british band so out of curiosity i'm gonna throw in eps real quick and just see who's on the come up that hasn't quite ah 
the old Nazi cover band Joy Division, an ideal for living. <laughs> oh, Bullet by the Misfits was released that year. The Middle Class, which is many people credit as like the first hardcore punk band in the U.S. Teenage Kicks by the Undertones, because their first record wouldn't actually come out until I believe 79. There's a Fall EP. Does the Fall have anything in 77? No, their first record no. isn't until 79. No, yeah, that's uh the f- yeah Bingo Masters Breakout is the first Fall release, uh, unless they have like a single, but it's like a three song EP though. So. Oh, DOA put out Disco Sucks, which is another very early hardcore release. Some Jane County as well, but Jane County has actually been around for a while by 78. They're a CBGB and Max's Kansas City band. Uh, Jane County has two albums in. 78 as well don't they maybe uh there's a storm the gates of heaven there's an electric i want to say there's a record that's called just the electric chairs um which is still jane county yeah there's the self-titled the electric chairs and storm the gates of heaven both came out in 78 so there's another double two albums yeah i would love to do something jane county at some point i don't know really which one to do yeah is, is Storm the Gates of Hell looks like it might be the higher rated r- record by them. So maybe that would be the one to keep in mind for the future. But I would definitely like to cover something by them. Trailblazers in like so many different ways, you know. Yeah. But yeah, well, let's get into the actual record. So I gave you 1978 and you selected Love Bites by the Buzzcocks. in England the band formed in 1976 this was released September 22nd 1978 on United Artists Records and it is their second full length album of 1978 following their debut record Another Music in a Different Kitchen and the person on this album is John Mayer on drums Steve Garvey on bass Steve Diggle on guitar and Pete Shelley on vocals and guitar the album was produced by Martin Rushnant who had previously worked with the band on the first record, as well as the third record they do, and around the same time was also producing albums by The Stranglers, XTC, 999, Generation X, The, Resil- the Resillos, and Dr. Feelgood. So Martin Rushnett was very involved in the punk explosion. And yeah, so, I, I, okay, the, the thing that I always ask is, uh, what made you choose this album? Out of all those options, what was it about this one that made you go, yeah, let's do this? Well, I slept on it. Because I was like, nothing's really like, nothing's really grabbing me. Nothing's really jumping out at me that I like really, really want to listen to and talk about. And so I just slept on it and I woke up in in the morning and I was like, yeah, let's just do Buzzcocks. <laughs> it just seems really obvious. You should just do the Buzzcocks. And I think that really what tipped the scale, it was, it was just like, why do I have a blind spot for this record? Why have I not rated it? I know another music in a different kitchen. Uh, we talked about a different kind of tension. Mm-hmm. on the show so i was like okay so there's what i remember of a different kind of tension i would like to see 
how this record in between the debut, which I've is kind of fresh in my mind is to what I remember of the record after this one, uh, which is the last Buzzcocks record at the time until their nineties, uh, reunion. So I was like with another music in a different kitchen in my head from having listened to it earlier this year, I was just thinking like, okay, I like that record. I enjoy it more or less. Yeah. I enjoy it from beginning to end. I think it's a really good record, but it's not great. Like, it's not an amazing record. And I knew from my memory that A Different Kind of Tension was not a, not a great record, for sure. Maybe not even a good record. Like, kind of a harder listen. So it was like, is Love Bites, is that a great record? Is that, like, the one? Is that the greatest Buzzcocks record? Can I put this to the test? Like, what what is the one singular Buzzcocks record? It was kind of my thinking going into listening to this record. So that that was really ultimately like the what pushed me over the edge to pick this one is like this is a band that lives in my head as a great band. But I don't think I can't pinpoint a great record, a single great record by them, like truly like four and a half, five star, like all time Buzzcocks record. So, well, you're you're already touching on something that I have in my notes here. So I was reading an article as a review around one of the reissues. I think they remastered this album around 2019, like from the original tapes. And it's like the remaster that doesn't feature the bonus tracks. It was just the actual record and the it was on Pop Matters. And that article says that the Buzzcocks never released a defining studio album, unlike most of their peers, like a ton of their peers have like a record, the record to listen to, uh, you know, says Sex Pistols. So never mind the Buzzcock Bullocks, um, their only record, but. It is still even would have probably been the one if they'd released more. People count Great Rock and Roll Swindle, too, as part of their discography. But, you know, The Clash have London Calling. The Damned have, I guess you can argue between the self-titled and Machine Gun Etiquette. But I think tradition, classically, people say Machine Gun Etiquette's their best record. And you go on. Like, you just pick every band that released multiple records from this era. And they all kind of have, like, that the one that stands above the rest. And the Buzzcocks are not that band. They, they're a the singles band. Bu- singles band yeah so the bus the buzzcocks definitive album is singles going steady yeah the compilation yeah i and that review also said that like their their best work was their singles and it's true their their singles are the ones i know the most there are tons of like non-album singles from this period that i know way better than the album cuts now this record has probably their biggest single on it ever and So that kind of makes this one a little bit more notable for that reason. But they're a singles band. And yeah, their Singles Going Steady album is probably their most. It's their highest rated release on Rate Your Music. It's the most popular release. Actually, I take that back. Love Bites is the most popular release on uh, Spotify. But if you look at the actual tracks, it's just because Ever Falling In Love is on here. Yeah. So Ever Falling In Love just gets more plays. And makes it the highest, but really the most listened to front to back is uh, Singles Going Steady. It was the one, it was the first thing that people in the U.S. got. Like, it was meant to be an introduction to the band, to the U.S. So, like, that's why so many people here are like, yeah, that's the one. But I think even in England, that's the one to listen to. Like, when you want to listen to the Buzzcocks, you tend to throw on Singles Going Steady. And, you know, I, I think that compilation is structured and put together so well that it feels like a record for a lot of people but yeah it is funny that it's like their greatest hits is the best record <laughs> like no no other band's greatest hits is their best record except the buzzcocks might be the one band whose greatest hits is their best record yeah they are they are the definitive singles band i think that is it like i think that's why their singles record their greatest hits record is they were a band that had the ability to put out incredible singles. They could write cookie songs. For some reason, they just never had the sensibility or the advice to save those songs and put them all on one record. <laughs> I don't know what the circumstances were or you know why they did that. But it, they just went to the studio with what they had. Were they not aware of what made their singles big songs where they like <laughs> innocent and naive and just like i think all of our songs could be <laughs> singles were they 
trying to make records where they're like, yeah, this is not a single song. This is a record song. I want this to be a record song. There's definitely songs on this album that I would not release as singles. Two instrumental tracks, you know, uh, (laughs) that song that Steve Diggle sings, like a lot of this stuff is not not singles worthy. But a lot of the A-side is. Yeah, it's a great A-side. Yeah, I was trying to decide, too. I was like, is this the Buzzcocks record? And I my final conclusion is there. I don't think there is one. I don't think there is one single album, studio album front. You know, even rate your music has this one rated like it's a 3.68. Meanwhile, the first album and the third album are 3.69s. So like even those two records are more well regarded. I think the first record is probably a little bit more popular of an album because it's a little more like straight ahead, a little bit more just like a punk record. It's very power poppy, very punk rocky. Like there's not a ton of experimentation on that album. Sequencing is a big deal for the Buzzcocks records too. Like another music in a different kitchen has autonomy as track three on the B side, which you say the name of that song and you're just like autonomy. Like you do, 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 do. That song just jumps into your head immediately. It has that killer hook. That's on the B side. You look at the B side of the bites. <laughs> which one jumps out to you? <laughs> um, Love is lies. Uh, isn't that the Steve song? <laughs> I think it is. Yeah. Um, Nothing left. I think that actually is my favorite on the on the B side, but it's yeah. kind of long, right? Isn't that like one of the? It's like yeah. The, see, the B side has like two over four minute songs and one five minute song, and the A side does not have anything. The, the closest they go is three thirty. So like yeah, the B side is like here's the experiments, <laughs> two instrumentals, a Steve song, <laughs> and two over four minute Pete songs, and ESP is like kind of an annoying song it has an annoying guitar part to it yeah now that being said the instrumentals are great i think walking distance and late for the train are excellent like they're excellent instrumental tracks i didn't think i would uh, enjoy them nearly as much so like they're cool they're really cool but you couldn't have put some vocals on there i feel like you could very easily turn walking distance into a song like a full song i think someone else in the someone else has a writing credit on that song let's let's pull that up real quick on the wikipedia Mm -hmm. um somebody not in the band walking distance was written by steve garvey who Who was their the bass bass player player. yeah so it's not even steve sings oh just luz has an alan dial credit and alan dial is um their manager james boone yeah and then the final track is all all of them get credited as writing that one yeah it's uh i think it's a jam song yeah i think it's just a jamming practice song and they were like let's record that yeah. It, yeah, you said ESP is kind of annoying. It has kind of an annoying guitar part. I don't hate that song. Again, the sequencing, it's we've got instrumental stuff on the B side. We've got these like, you know, not as standout songs on the B side. We have ESP, the like the weirder, more experimental song, and we have Lay for the Train ending the album on an instrumental jam. It's just like it's such a like visible running out of gas the closer you get to the end of the record. So I I can do a little bit of their story here, which might kind of explain why this record is the way it is. So the band formed when Pete Shelley and Howard DeVoto met while responding to a flyer looking for someone who also liked the Velvet Underground song Sister Ray. So they liked one Velvet Underground song and he flyered for it. They start a band and then while they have a band before the Sex Pistols like become a thing, 
the Buzzcocks didn't play their first show until after they'd seen the Sex Pistols live in 1976. Then later that year, they invited the uh, they invited the Pistols to come and play in Manchester, and the Buzzcocks were supposed to play with them at the time, but th- half the band had quit by that point. Howard Devoto quit because he did he was already over punk by 1977. He's already like. I don't like how this is going. It's not experimental enough for me. I'm going to go form the band Magazine, which he goes and joins and starts Magazine, which is definitely a much weirder band than yeah. the Buzzcocks are. Great, a good band. Great yeah, really good, but definitely weirder. Yeah. Yeah. Howard is just like, this punk sure is not creative enough. Let's do something different. So Buzzcocks couldn't play that show, but then they invited them back later. And then they got to actually like play with them. They had a full band by that point. So they later opened for the Sex Pistols and the Clash in their first London show, which shows you like how quickly everything was going by that point. Like your debut in London, you're opening for the Clash and the Sex Pistols, and you're getting the Sex Pistols to come and play in your in Manchester in '76, like pretty early on. And yeah, so after Devoto leaves, he Pete Shelley takes over vocals. Steve Diggle switches from bass to guitar. Then they go on tour with The Clash. Oh, that's right. They're also on the tour. They're on the Anarchy in the UK tour as the Damned's replacement. Because remember, they start the tour and then they leave it. And the Buzzcocks were their replacement, which was also The Clash, too. So then they go on tour with The Clash for the, the White Riot tour. They release their album, Another Music in a Different Kitchen, in March of 1978. That album hits number 15 on the charts. And then between tours... They then go in the studio and they record Love Bites. And it's just this like real whirlwind time period of like tour, 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 tour. Here's a record. Put it out. Tour to support the record. Now we're back in the studio recording another record. And now we're back out on the road and doing like a 26 date tour of the UK. So it's just I think that explains why it's this like they're on United Artists, which is a major label, a major label in the UK. Uh in the world too, just in general, they're a huge, huge record label. I tried to find records that came out that year to match them and could never get to the year. It, I was like a hundreds of pages deep into the, into the discogs of United artists. And it was just like, Oh, I did 15 pages of, of 1973 alone. I'm like, I'm never getting to this. This is too, <laughs> it's too big of a label that releases too much stuff and reissues and a million things. So it's a massive label. Punk's hot. And we're like, all right, get in there and record another record. And I think, I think it was really driving them. Like they were, they were just very pressured to like do more and more and more and more. And I don't think they handled that pressure very well. Cause they wind up breaking up like in what 1980 something, you know, very quickly right after the third record, they basically break up. So it's, yeah, this record I think is an example of they got, they went into the studio too quick. They weren't ready for their second album yet. They didn't have enough songs yet. Hence why there's two instrumentals. And uh, we'll let the other guy write a play, play a song, you know. So it's just this, I don't know, whirlwind. Meanwhile, they released their biggest single off of this record. Ever Fall in Love is the highest charting single by the Buzzcocks. It was hit number 12 on the charts. It's their most famous song. So even amongst all this like pressure, they still released like one of the greatest songs ever written. <laughs> yeah, Ever Fallen in Love. So obviously destined to be an all time great single, like from the first note that I mean, those that da na da na na da that two chord little riff right at the beginning. You're just like, Ugh, you know, your your pupils dilate <laughs> and it's just like the goosebumps on your arms go up. And then the hook like that is like a that song is a a perfectly formed. It's like a crystal skull. Like it, <laughs> It was dug out of the ground, just this like magically made object. Like it, it, it comes from another dimension. Like I don't understand how a band writes a song like that that I can hear so many times, and every single time I hear it, it's like whoa! Like <laughs> the end of 2001: Space Odyssey, just like <laughs> pushed back in your seat. Like I, <laughs> um. I, th- I feel like no matter how much you could like you could shrewdly dissect that song and like it, distill it to its parts and write another song based on everything that you analyzed from it. And it would not be good. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it wouldn't do the same thing. Like it might be good. It might be an okay song. It might be a memorable song, but it wouldn't do the same thing. It wouldn't hit you the same way. Yeah. There's like very few songs that like you can hear them over and over and over and over and over again. And like, you never get tired of it. Like, and this is one of the songs that I've heard a million times. This was one of the the songs I had on a burn CD that I scrawled classic punk on it because I, when I was downloading music, I could only I only knew how to download songs individually and I knew their name. So I threw their name on a bunch and just like downloaded a bunch of their songs. And this song being like one of the ones where I'm just like, but that one, though, like they have other great songs. They have tons of great songs, great singles. What do I get? Love that one so much. Fast Cars, Orgasmatic, just so many really fun, great songs. But Ever Fallen in Love is, you're right, it's magic. Like, it just, it's so good. Sidebar, uh, I read a Trouser Press article that brought up the fact that the band Fine Young Cannibals covered Ever Fallen in Love, yeah. and it's horrible. <laughs> Ever Fallen in Love with someone. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> But this is a song, too, that, uh, what is it? Was it like a Tony Hawk's American Wasteland or something like that? Like, where they had all the all the emo bands doing covers of, like, 77 in early 80s punk songs. And Thursday covers Ever Fallen in Love. And they just go, we're just going to do it the way Buzzcocks did it. Like, they they didn't change anything. It's, it's identical, you know. But, it, yeah, it's just a special, special song. And it is very funny that it is put on this record, which is... I don't know. I don't know what it was about the studio that just didn't quite when they go in there for a full record that they don't hit those highs nearly as much. Like, is there a song on their third album that's even like remotely up there? No, like there's not even like I believe is like the highest rated song on there. And that's a seven minute song. I don't I don't remember how that one goes. And music, another music in a different kitchen does have fast cars. And I don't mind. I don't mind. It's pretty great, too. But. Yeah, not quite in the same category as Ever Fallen in Love. And the A-side isn't isn't bad. Actually, the A-side's pretty great. Like, the opening track, Real World, is really fun. It's it's them kind of playing with some post-punk elements for the first time. So bringing in some different, like, type of bass lines. And, and then Operator's Manual is interesting. It's not my favorite song to listen to. It has a little bit of a mechanical feel to it. But then it's got Nostalgia, which I really like. It's another really good song. And 16 again, which is a little little more mid-paced, but another really good song. But, and Just Lust is solid as well. I do think the worst song on the album is the Steve Diggle song, Love is Lies. It's the one with like, the, it's like partly acoustic, starts with acoustic guitar intro. I don't know. I, I just did not particularly like that one that much. It sounds like, it sounds like a Rod Stewart song. <laughs> yeah. Like a Faces song, which I don't mind that. But yeah, it is like Steve's not as good of a singer and it's kind of a weird. Yeah, it it just it lands in that weird B side like oh, this is kind of an odd one. Yeah. But the other odd songs on the B side and <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, real world and operators manual like they're kind of, you know, they're kind of toying with other sounds. They, they even kind of sound like they were almost like influenced by like wire. Um, operator's manual has like the tempo or the time changes because they do like a waltz beat at one point in that song and has kind of like the odd starts and like a little guitar break and uh, it's kind of weird weird song structure and and a lot of like toying with different things i think that's i think it's one of the more successful of those kinds of songs in the buzzcocks but it is kind of where they're going and it is very often the downfall i think on Every bu- other Buzzcocks records, it's like, all right, when they're getting out there, they, they're getting too far out there. But I like, uh, you know, Operator's Manual, I do like the song a lot. I think it is at least grounded enough, but it is getting into the territory where they start to make mistakes. And it's like, if you were just, if you were striving to write Ever Fallen in Love and What Do I Get and Why Can't I Touch It and Orgasm Addict and Fast Cars and Autonomy, like if you were just trying to write only those kinds of songs you'd have killer records like beginning the end perfect like iconic records but they weren't doing that or they just didn't have the i don't know i don't know what their songwriting process was like did they just did they just happen to stumble on those songs 
maybe that's it. Maybe that's why they couldn't write LPs full of only those kinds of songs because they just accidentally wrote them. I guess it kind of comes down to what you want out of a record versus what you want out of a single and the type of things you're trying to achieve with each thing. In the UK at the time, like singles were such a big deal that they almost mattered a little bit more than the album. I don't know. I don't know how that it is interesting. The singles were cheaper, so you weren't bringing in as much, but you could also sell more of them because they were cheaper than the LPs. And then a lot of the LPs did not feature the singles on the records at all. Because I feel like if you just like put those singles that you recorded and released that were successful on the records, like re-record them for the record even, it would work. I feel like that becomes more of a model in the 80s, maybe. Like the single winds up on the record, even if it was out for months before the record came out. But then again, like bands like the Smiths and New Order have like these huge discographies of just singles that never were on LPs. And they just collect them all together in a singles compilation that wound up being one of their most popular records. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. I and mean, maybe it's just the UK model was just more more leaning towards singles. And so when you're going in to write a record, I don't know, I guess that's where you want to try your more exper- experimental stuff. That's where you want to try out the stuff where you're like, well, I would never release this as a single, but it could work in the context of an album, which is true. Like the the instrumentals work. I think they're really good. It's just weird. There's two of them, both on the B side, you know, and I feel like there's some of the better moments on the B side. So I don't know. You don't go, you don't go in the studio and try and write. Oh, we're going to write a record of all bangers, <laughs> just, <laughs> which I feel like no band does really. If you think about it, like who really goes in the studio and is like, we're going to write every song as if it could be a standalone single. The I think that's how you, huh? The Ramones. That's true. That's true. The first four Ramones records are, hey, this one's a killer single. <laughs> yeah. All right. Put it on there. What's the next one? Uh, another killer single. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, let's just keep doing that. <laughs> does that make a disjointed listening experience? Because a lot of times the things that you try and do to make just like a killer single is like not necessarily. I don't know. I don't know what you do. It's. There's probably a limit to how many times you can do that in a row. Because a lot of times the successful singles have something in common. Yeah. With the previous successful singles. So like you maybe it creates too much sameness if you try and just write a whole record of singles. Yeah. Which the Ramones records are very samey. Like <laughs> the songs are very samey to each other. But they're sh- they're short, though. They're to yeah. the point. Yeah. It's interesting. It's a different approach, I guess. We need another hit single like all the record labels making you go back in the studio and write a hit single. This record doesn't have any. So, like, I don't know. It's, it's, I guess I say this, like, it's expectation. Buzzcox is, a, they're so notoriously a singles band. And it's like they really had the potential to do nothing but amazing singles style songs. That it's just surprising that they don't have any studio album that is that from beginning to end. And it's like when the you, you want almost only those kinds of songs from a band and then you go listen to their albums and they don't have only those kinds of songs there's there's always that little bit of disappointment and also when you when you think of the buzzcocks as being a a band that people i think kind of erroneously but i see the reasoning call a pop punk band when buzzcocks are kind of held up as you know the first pop punk band and i think i understand why I think that it's just what punk sounded like. And I think if that's the definition, like then the, then the Ramones are the first pop punk band. 
which people will say that too. People will call Ramones pop punk. And I, again, I understand why they created a formula that is the formula that pop punk bands would follow. But if you, if you can, if you def, like the Buzzcocks are that proto pop punk band, if you're only looking at the singles material. But if you're looking at the three proper studio LPs, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. They're not. They're, their third record is mostly a post punk record. Yeah. You know, about a half of this one's a post punk record. You know, it's like the most definitive post punk band of all time. Wire is more consistently a pop punk band on their first album. <laughs> <laughs> like they had such a, a narrow range of songs that they just focused on and executed. And that's what. I think that's what I always want Buzzcocks records to do and they don't do. And it's not that the stuff that falls outside of that expectation are even necessarily bad. Cause I do think there's like late for the train, I think is a really instru- interesting instrumental song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really cool. I like what they do on that song a lot. There's a lot of interesting musical ideas. I don't think it needs to be six minutes long and I don't think it should have ended the record, but, but it's just that the way that the Buzzcocks don't, stay within that narrow field of like of quality and expectation is is why they don't have that definitive record one thing i was thinking of is where do they fall in that in the power rankings of the 77 punks like the uk punk scene as far as level of popularity or or fame like we have sex pistols one clash two Who's number three? Uh, would that be The Damned, maybe? I think it's The Damned. I think The Damned had longevity as a band. Albums that people actually like really enjoy front to back, too. Yeah, yeah. At least two like definitive classic albums. Are the Buzzcocks four in that ranking? If they are, it's impressive that they did it based purely on singles. I don't know. Probably. Especially if you're like avoiding post punk, like I'm specifically like trying to avoid post punk. Yeah. And then a lot of the other ones, like they didn't really start until much later, you know, undertones and stiff little fingers, like their albums came out much later than everyone else's. So, yeah, they're Yeah. The Buzzcocks have a very interesting um, history, a very they're super well regarded despite having like a defining record, though. I will say all three of the records are good, good to great. Like, I think all three of the first Buzzcocks albums are good records. But yeah, you're right. No, but it's just not that one over the others. Yeah. And I feel like the singles are just doing most of the heavy lifting when it comes to them. Because, you know, they came back in the 90s and like released a ton of albums. They have more records post reunion than they did during the initial run. You know, you know, it's, they started with trade test transmissions in 1993 they do all set they do modern they do a self-titled flat pack philosophy a different comp that's a compilation uh the way and then they even did the record post beat shelly's passing sonics and the soul but none of those records are like super well regarded they may have really just existed just to kind of give them an excuse to tour but they also kind of i don't know they leaned more into like what they were doing on a different kind of tension for everything they did following that, you know? Yeah. I mean, they have projects in the meantime. There's like flags of convenience, which was uh Steve Diggles post Buzzcocks band. John Mayer played in it from 81 to 86. Steve Garvey was in it. Pete Shelley had solo records from 1980 through 86. He had four solo records. And then there's the Shelley DeVoto record in 2002. I don't know. They don't Howard DeVoto solidified his legacy with just that first magazine record like that record is the magazine record you know i mean yeah i mean in some ways maybe the buzzcocks won uh in that they solidified a legacy on no single album yeah i mean they really they are just that band and they're not but uh i don't know I think that album is singles going steady. I think they're all, that yeah. their definitive album is the greatest hits. Like, <laughs> cause I, w- I was going to say like, maybe they're not, you know, they're not pigeonholed into one record, but they kind of are. They, mm. they do land like their greatest a- achievement is their ability to write incredible singles, <laughs> which singles 
can be an artist's lasting legacy. You know, like how many artists like are known for one hit wonders, like just a single that took off. That's their that's their legacy. That's their like thing that is remind you know remembered throughout time. And a lot of times those singles are more remembered than like a full album. Yeah, because I think most people listen to songs and not albums in general nowadays. I mean, maybe back when you could only buy actual singles and albums. I mean, you could make a mixtape, which a lot of people did. But that also took a lot of work to make. So, like, I guess in the digital era, that's when it becomes like, oh, I just listen to songs. I mean, I guess you could have just listened to the radio. That could have been the thing you listen to only or watched MTV. But in general, people only are more just songs people now. So my wife's a songs person. She's not an album person. Um, and so many people I knew, like in college, I, I was I remember being like, what? You don't listen to whole records all the time? Like most of their listening is mix cds and playlists on shuffle and your your itunes on shuffle what you don't put the album on and listen track one to track 12 and no interruptions Uh, so i guess ideally you stand a higher chance of your singles becoming more legendary and iconic than your albums so i don't know i guess if you think about other bands of their their same time i think the damned are probably more known for their albums than their singles except for like new rose but the Clash might, your average person knows the singles, not so much the albums. Yeah, I mean, if you had any like radio hit singles, the average person is going to know those singles better than. But the Clash have London Calling. Like yeah. they have that album, a double album. Uh, you know, they made a point of making albums and I think they accomplished making an album as a work, as yeah. like a big capsule of collecting a bunch of different ideas and putting them all in one place and having them work together as an album how does love bites work does like how does that stand up does it feel uh, i think it's still very enjoyable i think it's still very good Mm -hmm. it it starts so strong that it gives you enough momentum to listen to the whole album uh despite the b-side being kind of weird and sequenced weird i think the b-side is just sequenced weird if there were like if you swapped like one song from each side like you could maybe throw the two minute instrumental on the a side and then like take one of the stronger songs from the a side to the b side yeah that was what i was gonna say is i would take the first instrumental the steve garvey instrumental and put that at the end of the a side and then maybe bump maybe just bump 16 again as the front of the b side just swap the yeah the corners you know I think Late for the Train is fine as an album closer. I think the B-side needs another standout, and I think 16 again would be would make that the standout of the B-side. Though nothing, I, don't know, I really do like Nothing Left. That is probably still my favorite on the B-side. But uh, it adds length, but the extended version does kind of fix the record a little bit. Love You More, Noise and Noise, mm-hmm. that stuff being on the on the latter, very latter end of that. If you have the time, if you're listening that far. Like it brings you back more towards the center of what the buzzcocks sound like. Yeah, I was going to say the version on Spotify is the extended version, which is like the 1994 CD version uh, or 96 remaster is what this says. So uh, it includes the four singles. Love you more. Noise and noise promises and lipstick. Uh, some of them are B-sides, um, but they're all singles. And I think a lot of those are on singles going steady, too. But lipstick is fun because it has the same riff of the magazine song shot by both sides yeah <laughs> it's the same like da, 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 da. that riff is in the song which is a fun little nod to a howard devoto and i do think that a lot of those love you more noise annoyed part, i think all of those songs are probably maybe not all of them but are better than most of the b-side so i think yeah. having those wrap up your cd version works i mean it's like 48 minutes with the bonus tracks it's not that long you know so, yeah, I think, honestly, they fixed it by putting it out as just an extended version on CD in the 90s. This would have been a record, though, that if they'd released it in the U.S. when it was new, the U.S. label probably would have reordered the whole record. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is like the Undertones album, right? Didn't they do that to the Undertones where they just, like, swapped the whole thing around and then, like, added songs to it, too? <laughs> well, like, the first Clash record is all shuffled. Yeah, yeah, completely different track listing. This would have been one of the whatever U.S. label would have had the rights to it would have been like, 
all right, we got to fix this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and they probably would have swapped out something for a single, you know. Yeah. Around this time. What else, out of curiosity, what were the singles of 1978? So in 78, what do I get? I don't mind. Those would be more tied to the first LP. Moving away from the pulse beat. Love you more. Noise and noise. Yeah. Knowing U.S. record levels, they would have just put like one of those. Love you more. Noise and noise or promises and lipstick on the album and probably swapped out the first. I bet you they would have taken the first instrumental out completely. It probably ended it on the other one. Yeah. Knowing the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. I think they would have. They would have <laughs> completely butchered the track listing, the original intended track listing. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what we try and listen to anyway, whenever we listen to these records. Like we prefer to do the original release track listing. Sometimes it's not possible, but we do what we can. Sometimes uh, sometimes they get it right. These like studios and reorganizing things. Sometimes it works a little better. And then sometimes they just put all the best songs at the front of each side <laughs> and then just like let it trail off. <laughs> They weren't so much worried about structure. They were just wanted you to put the record on to listen to the first couple songs and just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to rate it? Give it a good old star rating. Sure. I'd give it a solid four. I am right there with you. I was thinking a 4.0 just right. It's what would you call that? Good, not great. No, I feel like four is higher than good. I feel like. Yeah, I think it's really good. It's a really good record. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good record. With like some really I good think... songs on it. Like, I think even when it subverts expectations, it doesn't do so in a way that's bad. Right. It's just, damn, I want that one <laughs> Buzzcocks record. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's the approach that we we came into it looking for this to be the one. And it's not the one. And in all reality, the first record probably is the one. If we're going with pure studio records, that one may feel the most cohesive. Yeah, I think it this is. might this might be the most scattered of the three original because the third one feels like the most experimental as a record from front to back. Depending on what you want out of an album, you could maybe like that one a little more. Um, but yeah, I think another music from different kitchens probably like the easiest to go down as like a as a album structure. I bet it's I haven't listened to it in a minute, but I bet it's samey though. That might be its biggest problem. Yeah, that's kind of what I remembered from earlier this year. Is it there's songs that are in the same lane but not as memorable for the most part they just lack that one hook in the chorus or something but yeah still very enjoyable at the beginning to end still a 4.0 record for me like i do think these first two albums are both 4.0 records just singles going steady is a 5.0 yeah prob- <laughs> probably <laughs> well, all right i think that does it for us thank you everyone for listening um next week's episode don't know what we're gonna do well we'll figure out what we haven't covered in a minute what decade we haven't hit in a minute and it's kind of funny like the the selections that you had initially sent got me thinking we could do the deepest cuts we possibly could choose for an album like it's like a a mini theme like we just are like the most obscure thing that you already are a fan of probably that helps make it yeah your selection you could just be like here's this Croatian band. Like, no, no pick something, you know, that's good, but like never talked about. I'll I'll have to see what year we've done in the least amount of time in our decade. We haven't hit in a minute. And, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that'll be my approach for that episode. (laughs) Maybe it'll be my, uh, yeah, just deep cut that no one's going to ever listen to the episode on. Cause yeah, (laughs) nobody knows who that band is. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. You can follow us on all forms of social media, Instagram, Twitter, Blue Sky. You need an invite? Let me know. Uh, I put up all my invites on Twitter and a bunch of strangers got them. So I was kind of I was like, oh, nobody, I, nobody that follows us got them. Annoying. But uh, I can give you mine. Dylan's got a bunch. Just hit us up and uh, we'll we'll send them to you if you need a Blue Sky invite. And uh, I don't know why we're trying to recruit people to Blue Sky. <laughs> I, I guess we just have these codes and they burn a hole in my pocket and <laughs> we're on facebook we're on something else i think it threads oh i haven't looked at that thing in forever but all of the stuff at punk lotto pod punk lotto pod gmail.com voicemail line 202 688 punk and uh yeah that'll do it and we will talk to you next week
To order Punk, call the number on your screen. Rush delivery is available. Remember, this special offer is not sold in stores.